Michael Osterlink here, and I'm honored to have uh, Josh Mance in a conversation today about his new program, The Asymmetric Therapist. How you doing, Josh? Hey, how you doing, Michael? Great to hear from you. It's uh, great to hear from you and great to see you. So you are a former major in the U.S. Army, a combat veteran. You're an author of the book, Beauty of the, a Darker Soul. And you're also a PhD candidate in consciousness studies at the California Institute for Integral Studies. And uh, you're soon to be launching, as I said, the Asymmetric Therapist Program here in 2019, uh, January 2019. Um, and one of the things I want to talk to you about is kind of do a deeper dive into this amazing, much needed program that you're offering. But before we do, maybe some context, you know, a little bit about yourself, what led you down the path you are now on to create this kind of program. So over to you, Josh. Who, who's Josh Mance? Sure. Sounds, sounds good. Hey, yeah, again, great to be here. Um, yeah, the, the brief, brief history is, um, you know, I was an infantry officer in the army for about 10 years. And, uh, this whole thing started back in 2007 when I was shot and killed by a sniper in Baghdad. Uh, and the bullet severed my femoral artery and I, I went on to flatline for 15 minutes straight. Uh, and somehow was pulled back, uh, retained full recollection of the event, uh, all my limbs intact. It was, it, it was, it was a miracle, nothing short of a miracle that, that, uh, what the medical team pulled off there was phenomenal. Um, but long story short is, is about two years later, um, in, in 2009, the department of defense was starting to get very serious about the behavioral health challenges that service members were facing when they returned home from combat. And I was uh, basically asked to enter into the national speaking circuit at that point uh, with the effort of reducing or eliminating stigma associated with help seeking behavior uh, and, and, and did that extensively. Um, and, you know, everything has really uh, revolved in my life around uh, impacting the field of psychological trauma and helping people understand the truth behind trauma. There's a lot of misconceptions out there. Uh, and similarly, within the military and first responder professions, which are both inextricably linked, um, there's some very unique challenges uh, within those cultures, within those subpopulations, um, that we need to help uh, clinicians and peer support personnel better understand uh, in order to deliver effective treatment and help them participate in the process of transformation. You come from it, I think, two very, very interesting streams that come together really nicely. Obviously, your experience as a combat veteran, thank God you survived being shot and killed. Uh, you know, so you've actually survived, the, the survived and not thriving in the context of PTS, combat, et cetera, et cetera. But you're also doing a PhD in consciousness studies at the California Institute for Integral Studies. So you also have the deep knowledge and wisdom that you're studying there. So we've heard a little bit about your, your experiences in combat. Can we jump a little bit to your studies in graduate school and how they are kind of coming together nicely in this new program you're offering starting in 2019, The Asymmetric Therapist? Yeah, you know, so I'll, I'll tell you the... Um, <laughs> I really believe that education is is such a powerful asset uh, in terms of uh, integrating our past experiences and uh, gaining a new perspective in the future. Uh, you know, psychological trauma, one of the characteristics of a traumatic experience or extreme adversity is that it leaves us trapped in our past constructs and beliefs about the world. So I really believe that creativity and innovation is essentially the inverse of psychological trauma. And one thing that can catalyze that process is, is education. Um, so right now I'm in a master's program at the California Institute of Integral Studies uh, and, and rolling straight into a PhD on the topic, which we're about to discuss. Um, I, I entered this program uh, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful for, uh, for CIIS. Um, the, the focus on, on consciousness kind of makes sense for the dead guy to study. Right. Right. And, um, you know, I, the, the, the more I continue to refine uh, uh, my message, the talks that I deliver across the country, uh, the more 
the more people have deeper questions about life and death and transformation and overcoming adversity. Um, so, so for me, I was in a dead sprint professionally for the last 15 years and, um, pushing myself to enter this, this master's program role and, 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 you know, again, plenty to roll right into the PhD, but it's, it's unlocking, um, it's unlocking so many new concepts and allowing me to really, uh, really refine this message in a way that, that ultimately impacts people on a greater level. Um, so I, I'm, 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 I'm not for purposes of the course that we're about to discuss. Uh, I'm, I'm not bringing in consciousness yet at that point, that'll be down the road. Um, but you know, a big central focus of, of their program at CIS is, is, is a, is a deep focus on philosophy uh, and, and, and really integrating uh, multiple disciplines such as quantum physics and psychology and philosophy uh, in order to approach some of the most difficult questions that we ask about life. Right on. And, and th this uh, could be a completely other no another conversation that I, I can't wait for you and I to have, maybe even offline, because as you know, we both share the, the studies at the California Institute for Integral Studies. Um, but let's not spend too much time on that. Uh, I did hear you say meaning, transformation, consciousness, and I know that those will be interconnected through your course and then down the road, as you said, maybe some advanced work, but let's, let's jump right into the asymmetric mind. You have created a program for clinicians and others to do support work for combat veterans and first responders. Is that accurate? That's, that's accurate. Uh, so the context for this, Michael, is, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges that, uh, that we face across the country today, regardless of your background or population, is psychological trauma, right? And we, we see it everywhere within our society. Um, but one of the keys for a, a clinician uh, or a peer support uh, person in, in order to resonate with the client is, is the ability to have a, a firm grasp on the culture uh, from which that person is coming from. Uh, there was actually a large study conducted uh, back in 2002 timeframe that uh, looked at what are, the, what are the factors that contribute to a successful therapeutic outcome, right? So if you and I, if, if you're a therapist and I'm a client, what are the factors that go into making that a success? Uh, and the answers might actually surprise you. Um, 40% of that outcome is attributed to factors completely outside the office of the therapist. Hmm. So this really means the social network that the person is surrounding themselves with. Are, am I surrounding myself with the right relationships in hmm. my life? Are those relationships productive to my healing process or are they a detriment to it? Um, and second, you know, as, as you are intimately familiar with, right, this comes down to self-leadership. You know, it's, it's not as if any of us can walk through the door of a therapist and expect them to fix us, right, or fix the problem. There's a high degree of responsibility on us as well. Uh, so this is, this is, you know, how we're leading ourselves physically, spiritually, emotionally, socially, and, and, and whatnot. So that accounts for 40% of the factors. Uh, 30%, the second biggest chunk, comes down to the therapeutic relationship or the therapeutic alliance between the clinician and client. And what that really means is one word, trust, right? So in order to establish trust, right, some of the key qualities of that are, you know, we have to display empathy, humility. Uh, we have to create a safe environment in which people can feel comfortable disclosing some of the most vulnerable aspects of their lives, right? And in order to establish trust, in order to make that connection, I need to have a firm understanding of the culture and the experience in which the person came from, Right. So already we're at 70%. Now the other two factors, one, 15% is placebo effect, and the other 15% is actually clinical skill set or the specific modality that's being used in treatment, right? So, so, so what this really speaks to, and, and the reason that I'm approaching this program, all right, is, is what the asymmetric mind, excuse me, the asymmetric therapist program is approaching, um, is, is arming uh, clinical providers with the cultural context that they need in order to deliver effective care to veterans and first responders. Uh, the clinicians already have the skill set, but very few are trained uh, in, in, the, in the culture. 
uh, of those environments and specifically, and, and this is where the name comes in specifically, uh, the complexities of the modern operating environment, the complexities of asymmetric warfare and counterinsurgency, uh, which are considered to be the most maddening and complex form of war. And it's an environment today that is infused with moral and ethical conflicts, uh, sometimes in subtle places where we least expect it. Before we kind of do a deeper dive into the actual modules and what you'll be teaching um, <clears throat> in terms of giving context to clinicians or other support personnel to work with first responders and combat vets, um, let's talk about kind of the structure of your program. I already mentioned it starts in January 2019. Um, that's your, one of your first cohorts. Obviously, it's going to continue on into many, many years because Unfortunately, we have a lot of people who need help, and you're going to be there training the people who can help them do these kind of things. What's it, tell them more about the structure, how this is going to work. We do know it's online. What's that look like in practice? Yeah, sure. So obviously, as you know, like I'm a professional speaker and trainer. I'm, I'm traveling around the country all the time, which is great. And um, you know, this is certainly uh, deliverable in full-day, half-day workshops to organizations uh, but to get this out to more people, right, to really create an ecosystem of care to surround uh, our first responders and military personnel with, um, we're, I, I'm, I'm offering this online as well. And, it, you know, I, I really believe that, um, you know, one of the reasons why I think a lot of online programs struggle is, is that there's, there's limited interaction with the author, right? And uh, that's really important to me. And, and it's really important. Uh, when we're dealing with such a complex topic, uh, that the audience has the opportunity to interact and form intimate cohorts uh, and, and really truly build the relationships necessary to create a full ecosystem. Uh, so what the structure of the program looks like is, is it takes place over eight modules uh, that occur once a week. Uh, the size of each cohort is no bigger than 25 uh, people per cohort. And the key is after every, with each module, there'll be uh, uh, some required videos, a little bit of required reading. It's not designed to be too academically intense because I know people are uh, very busy. Um, but after those readings and videos are complete, we actually hop online after each module with each specific cohort and do a live Zoom session. Nice. Um, you know, in, in order to really drive that discussion and clarify it. So we're looking here, what I'm looking for, what I'm trying to achieve is, is um, to develop the real relationships that are necessary uh, to solve one of the most complex social challenges that we're facing today. Um, so eight modules, a module a week, so it's two months. What happens, in, let's, let's say someone goes for the program two months and one day after they finish your program. What's it mean to finish your program and what can they, what are they then able to do? Well, for right now, what we're, what we're doing and there's, there's lots of plans here moving forward. Um, but initially, you know, one of the biggest challenges uh, in the behavioral health field as a whole, again, speaking more broadly for a moment uh, is, is what we call the continuum of care, mm -hmm. right? So, so what tends to happen is if, if I'm uh, struggling with, uh, an addiction or alcoholism, you know, just to use something that, that, that people can resonate with here for a moment. Uh, you know, if I'm struggling with an addiction and I go to a residential treatment center or an inpatient program, I might be at that program for 30 days and I may get the, uh, you know, phenomenal care. I may really catalyze my healing process, but where the true long-term transformation takes place is afterwards. Right. So, so for that 30 day period, the problem with that is I'm on a bit of a utopia. You know, I, I'm, I'm not surrounded with all the other triggers and all the other factors in my life that may lead to a relapse. So what's crucial is linking that person when they discharge from a facility like that to a local network, to an intensive outpatient program, to an outpatient therapist um, who, who can continue the momentum of that healing process. Right. And the same holds true. Uh, in the military and, and, and first responder communities. Um, so what we have right now is, uh, you know, for example, there's a lot of uh, military-based, veteran-based uh, programs that exist, whether that's, whether that's for psychological treatment or whether that's through the nonprofit world, uh, where people will have phenomenal experiences while they're part of the program. But where many people struggle is, is what do I do now? Where, where do I connect this person with a culturally competent therapist 
uh, who can help us continue the momentum. You know, the, the Department of Veteran Affairs, for example, uh, only about 20% of their clinicians are uh, considered to be culturally competent and prepared to work with veterans, wow. right? Which is pretty stunning. They, they actually uh, highlighted that to a congressional testimony at the end of 2017. Um, and I just saw a RAND study that came through that was done in the state of New York that, that said only about 5% of the clinicians in that state are fully prepared to work with these populations. Um, part of the reason of that, this is both an opportunity and a challenge, right? The VA is really starting to open up its network to private practitioners in, in, in the private sector, okay. right? So we're opening up to to new therapists and clinicians who might have phenomenal skill sets, a phenomenal therapeutic capability, yet they've never worked with military or first responders before. Mm-hmm. And, and where I really come into play is I, I am fortunate to, to speak both languages fluently. Um, and, and what I've essentially done is taking uh, the most complex form of warfare, asymmetric warfare, which is the nature of the environment we face across the world today. And I have overlaid it with uh, the, the doctrine, if you will, of psychological trauma and the modalities in use. And I've synthesized a product uh, that allows the clinician to quickly internalize uh, the essence of the modern operating environment. Clinician, that, would this include as a social worker, as managing family therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, nurses, medical doctors? Correct. And, and, anyone in the medical anyone in the medical field who touches veterans or first responders could benefit from this training. Um, anyone anyone from a peer support role could benefit from this training. Um, it's it's highly unique. It's novel, um, and and it's it's desperately needed. Um, so the end state of this to to circle back to the very beginning of your question: what what happens after they go through this course? Yeah. Is I'm actually creating a database of clinicians. Okay. So, so, you know, you can visualize that there will be a map of anyone who has gone through the foundation course, right? Where their information will be posted on that map. And if, if, uh, if an individual is discharging from a facility or coming out of a nonprofit program, that nonprofit now has the capability to utilize that database, okay. uh, search by zip code and identify a therapist who, who at a minimum is going to have some degree of cultural competence and, and more importantly, reach back in communication with the larger network. Um, so my objective, my mission is to train 10,000 clinicians by the year 2022 wow. in order to create a, a, an ecosystem of support, an ecosystem of culturally competent clinicians uh, that can help these folks participate in, in the transformative process. So uh, two months, one day, they'll be certified in this system and then they'll be listed on a database that anyone can access who's looking for, um, you know, post utopia support over time. As you said it, let's uh, jump into the course itself. You said there's eight modules. Um, obviously we're not going to do a deep dive in each of the modules. That's what you can be doing when you, when you offer the course itself, but give us an idea of what some of the modules will look like, some of the things you'll be training in terms of competence, in terms of asymmetric warfare, and what clinicians need to know in order to better serve their clientele or support staff. Sure. Yeah, so, so the first two modules is really a ramp up that, that uh, talks about the truth behind psychological trauma. Right. So um, I, I know you and I met last year when you, you heard me talk at an event in, in Southern California. Um, and, and, you know, helping people crack through the barriers of what psychological trauma really is, is an, is an important foundation to lay. You know, some of the principles that, that I've, I've kind of uncovered and project over the years is that psychological trauma is not always what it seems to be. You know, uh, even though the nature of our experiences can be very different, the emotions that manifest from them can be very similar, right? So, so, so trauma does not discriminate. Right, it, it's 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 often found in places where we least expect it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, for for example, many people, um, you know, and, and I fell prey to this myself. But uh, it is it is easy to look. In in my case, it's easy to look at this big gigantic event of this near death experience and make the assumption uh, that any emotional pain or turmoil I'm experiencing is is generated from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it took me almost ten years to figure out that that wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, even even with clinical support along the way, you know the the uh, 
the essence of what I had to understand and come through and, and, and what I see continuously in the first responder and military populations is that the root cause of chronic traumatic distress uh, rests with the moral and ethical implications of the modern operating environment, right? The moral wounds, the things that fundamentally disrupt the way we believe the world should work uh, and, and how we integrate those experiences into our life in the present moment. Um, the second module uh, dives into trauma on a little bit of a deeper level and looks at it through the lens of uh, you know, hyper arousal, hypo arousal, and, and uh, emotional withdrawal, which is something that's quite prevalent uh, in the first responder military communities. Um, the third module, as the primary focus of, this, of the total course, is really revolving around the moral and ethical implications of the modern operating environment. Uh, the third module, uh, focuses exclusively on guilt and shame. Uh, and then we really start to ramp up the course in module four when we talk about the philosophy of modern war, uh, which, which really is, that's what really explains uh, the nature of the modern operating environment to clinicians. Now, if you're a clinician or a peer support person and you've never served in these environments, you've never served in the military or law enforcement professions, you might be a little bit intimidated at this point and say, how could I possibly understand the most complex form of warfare? right? Mm -hmm. uh, but what if I told you that as a clinician, you already possess some of the very best qualities of the very best counterinsurgents? Mm -hmm. And that's because today in the operating environment, uh, our ability to succeed isn't just grounded in tactical expertise. The center of gravity of success in today's environment hinges on our ability to build trusted relationships with people in the local population. Right. So again, that requires empathy. It requires humility. It requires trust. Um, and this course is delivered through that lens. Um, in the uh, next two modules, we spend teasing out the paradoxes of the modern operating environment uh, and things that are just counterintuitive uh, that we that we encounter on the job or in military deployments. Uh, some of those paradoxes are things like sometimes the best weapons do not shoot. Sometimes the best reaction is no action. Uh, the more successful the counterinsurgency effort, uh, the less secure and safe we may be. So th there's uh, the bottom line here is that there's, uh, there's enormous um, windows into moral and ethical wounds that, that, that those paradoxes by default present. Uh, and, and the idea is to to help clinicians learn how to ask better questions or, or look for more subtle clues that may pinpoint the root cause of the trauma. Uh, the seventh module we spent specifically talking about leadership, uh, both on and off the battlefield within the modern operating environment. And then in the eighth module, uh, I've, I've actually found a way to invert counter, some of the principles of counterinsurgency strategy back upon itself hmm. and essentially help the clinician learn how to use that strategy against itself in a therapeutic context. So it's, it's pretty interesting stuff, <laughs> you know, I, I, but bottom line is we, we can use some of the relationship building strategies and some of the conceptual understanding uh, to, to essentially bridge the gap between the two communities. Uh, and, and, and the idea here is, is that, um, you know, this effort does not just stop with this one course. Um, no one course like this is going to make anybody an expert in, the, in this environment. It's a journey. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, with uh, one of the advantages of signing up for this thing now is, is uh, that you're getting a year-long membership with it. Uh, so we're going to be sending out subsequent videos that build on the content that you've already received um, and, and to, to kind of continue the network, continue the relationships, and continue the development. Wow, that's fantastic. So just to kind of quickly review, it's uh, eight cohorts, two months. First cohort starts in January. That's correct. Uh, you're limiting it to uh, 20 people per cohort. It's uh, online. It's, uh, you, you have like courses that are taught, and then you do Zoominars to have uh, kind of dialogues around what was learned and discussed. Um, when the person finishes up after the two months and one day period of time, they're now certified within your system and better, not completely qualified, but better qualified. Right. They'd be 
more qualified over time because you're going to be offering advanced trainings over time. But they're yep. more qualified than they were to work with combat veterans and first responders by better understanding the worldview, the experiences, the thinking processes that um, the combat veterans and first responders are embedded in, really. Accurate? That's, that's accurate. Yep. This, this, will, this will help them feel the essence of what it means to serve today. Nice. Right. Um, your course is relatively, really, really, not relatively, very inexpensive. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Look, here's the deal. You know, I, um, I, I'm, I'm offering this entire course right now at, at, you know, if you sign up before the end of the year, I'm offering it for $75 for the entire thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, that's going to have to go up next year because it, it is very expensive to uh, create this content, to host it. Uh, but you know, the, the people in the behavioral health field, peer supporters, they're my people, yeah. you know, I, I, um, I really think clinicians are the heroes of the invisible battlefield that we're facing all across the country today. Um, and, and their professions, uh, are, are somewhat misunderstood, uh, and, and minimized, uh, not a whole lot of people can understand really what it's like to be a clinician, right? To, to, to repeatedly and constantly um, stay with people in their most vulnerable moments. Um, so I, I, at the same time, it's, it's not a very lucrative profession either. You know, so, so a, lot of, a lot of our folks in the healing professions are doing phenomenal work. Uh, peer supporters are doing phenomenal work. And, and, and they're doing it truly out of selflessness and sacrifice, right? Um, so I know there's not a whole lot of money uh, in, 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 in those professions. Um, and, and, you know, it's important to me to, to get this information out to, to, you know, to as many people as possible right and on. to keep this content affordable, right? So it's, it's going to go up next year, but uh, not by much. We, we haven't totally hinged in on the, on the final price yet, but... Now, for folks who would be interested in learning more about the program and possibly signing up, how would they go about doing that? Yep. The, the, the best place to go is, is the website. Uh, you can watch an introductory video uh, on that website that's about seven minutes long. Uh, you can download a, a three-page brochure that basically gives you the outline of the course uh, and a brief description. Um, and you can register right off the same page. Uh, so the, the address to that is uh, asymmetric mind dot com backslash clinical dash training awesome well josh uh great to see you uh great to talk hey, it's great to see you too michael and uh blessings on this uh new adventure it's so so important and uh i hope you're able to get uh, more than ten thousand clinicians over the, over the time to sign up and really help heal our veterans and our first responders so uh good luck to you we're making that happen, brother. It, it takes an ecosystem to do it, you know, and um, just fortunate to be in the position uh, that we're in right now. Uh, and I appreciate you helping us get the word out. Right on. All right. Talk to you soon, man. Hey, likewise. Take care.